are now recording. So I'm going to switch over and allow me to share my entire screen with you. Good morning. Okay, this is not allowing me to share my screen. I'm going to have to get creative this morning, guys. It is not allowing me to share my screen with you for some reason. Okay, this is going to be a little unconventional, and I you, apologize in advance. Go ahead, Wendy. Sorry, could you post uh, your presentation on the Facebook page, like a link to your presentation? Uh, we, like, if you had slides or anything you wanted to share, could you put that link on the Facebook page? Would that help you? Since you were going to share your screen. Um, I'm going to pull it up on my desktop computer and let you guys see that from here because I want you guys to be able to see the, the visuals as I'm going over them. Okay, so I don't know if this is going to work very well or not, but I think it's going to be better than not having a visual. Can you guys see this? yes okay so we'll do it this way I am so sorry for some reason it is telling me it will not let me share my screen so that is not good I will have to probably work with the tech team to get that fixed um, so I'm gonna start over um, welcome to our um, presentation this is our clip presentation and in parentheses there I explained that clip is a big acronym that just stands for a district improvement plan and uh, we are presenting this plan to our stakeholders today for the 22-23 school year. And a stakeholder is just anyone that has a vested interest in uh, what the school system's plans are going to be. So that could... Um, okay, we have some people having issues with audio, but other people are able to hear. So that may be uh, an issue with the other person's computer system. I apologize for that. Um, but a stakeholder can be a staff member, it can be a parent, it can be a business, business partner, or anyone in the Walker County community that is being impacted by our district improvement plan. So everyone here today is a stakeholder. And some things that we're going to be going over today, um, here is our agenda or the outline of the content. Um, in a minute, I'll be welcoming you and sharing the purpose of this in more detail. We'll be talking about our district strategic plan, our district goals, district action steps, family engagement for Walker County School System, and then a feedback session. Um, for those of you that are just joining, we're having technical difficulty, but I'm getting really creative here. So I'm going to turn this back to me for a minute while I introduce myself. Hi everyone, my name is Autumn Hintz and I have worked in Walker County for over 17 years. Um, this will be my second year, two and a half years actually, as our District Federal Programs Coordinator and I also work with our ESOL department. And um, so the purpose for this meeting today is that I want to share with you the process of how we create a district plan and um, all of the things that we've come up with to be in our plan and we want to gather feedback. I'm going to put you back to this screen so you can see um, the visual. So the way we come up with a district improvement plan involves several facets but the three main things is that we have what's called the Georgia's system of continuous improvement and that is where the state of Georgia requires us to um, go through this system of continually improving our district where we analyze data, we brainstorm where are our strengths and weaknesses, 
what are some things we can do to improve that? We implement those things and then we recheck the data to see, did that make a difference or did it not? And do we need to revise our plan? The second thing is ESSA, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act that was formed in 2015. And it says everything that the Georgia Systems of Improvement, uh, Continuous Improvement Plan says, but it also says that we need to gather stakeholder feedback, which is what today is for. And then also we undergo a Cognia review every several years, and it is an outside team that comes into our school district and they in do interviews, look at our paperwork, look at our implementation, they go into the schools, check out what we're doing, check our evidence, and then they give us a report that tells us what did we do well, what are some areas that we need to continue to work on, and with all three of these things, we come up with our strategic plan and our district improvement plan that I'm going to share with you today. Also, as you're listening to my presentation today, I'm going to give you a link that will allow you to sign in and also give feedback. So be thinking as I'm presenting, or what are some things that you liked that you heard today? And also, what are some things that we might need to consider adding? Or some information that you can share with us that we need to be aware of that will help us improve or revise these plans. Because we do have the opportunity to revise. It's a living document that we submit to the state every year. So we would love to hear uh, your feedback about what we're doing well or what are some other things we need to consider. So this slide here is our district strategic plan that we are going to be working on throughout this year to create a draft. And we've taken the feedback from all three of those um, entities that we talked to you about in the last slide, especially with Cognium because that is a team that's outside of our district that is giving us their expert opinion based on what they have seen and heard and learned while they were with us last year. So the four main areas that we want to make sure that we are um, improving are, first of all, we want student success for all of our students. No matter what type of services they're receiving, we want all students to be able to experience success. The second area is that we want to improve our communication and our engagement level of staff members, parents, and students. Third, we want to make sure that we are cultivating and we're providing professional development um, and quality experiences for our teachers because we want to be able to retain our quality teachers and make sure that they are being successful and feeling supported. And then number four is we want to make sure that we have an excellent organizational structure. We want to make sure that our processes that are in place are being effective and that we are functioning in a way that is the most efficient that we possibly can. Those are just um, broad topics that we'll be focusing on. And today we'll be going into more detail as to the action steps that are in our district plan that you will notice support all four of these areas. All right, on this next slide, we're going to be talking about our district goals. Um, they continue to be the same three areas that our data is showing need to show improvement. Um, we have an attendance goal that during this year, we want to make sure that we see a 3% decrease in the number of students that are absent from school for 15 days or more. Um, it's very difficult for a student to show growth when they have a high number of absences. So we would like to see that number decrease from last year's um, attendance to the, the end of this school year. So from 2022 data um, to 2023. And that will be measured by the data that we have in our SLDS platform and our data warehouse. And then we continue to show a need um, to see improvement in our students being successful in reading and in math, both of those core academic areas. So during the 2022-2023 school year in both reading and math, we want to see a 3% increase from our fall to spring data in our MAP for reading MAP medium RIT score. So um, both of those we're going to be using the MAP benchmark test for our uh, first through eighth grade students. And that's how we're going to be measuring whether we're going to be making academic progress in those two subject areas. Now you'll notice at the bottom of this screen, I have a, a note and it's about federal programs. 
So our district improvement plan, what I'm focusing on today because I am the federal programs coordinator, I'm going to be looking at how are our federal programs going to be supplementing what our district local um, funding already pays for. So some of our federal programs that you'll hear me refer to are Title I, which are our federal funds that support our economically disadvantaged students. Um, currently, our middle schools and um, all but one of our elementary schools qualifies for Title I services. Fairland Elementary School um, does not qualify for that. Their free and reduced lunch percentages are too low for the um, state and federal government to allow them to qualify for those extra funds. Um, we have Title II federal funds, which focuses on professional development for our staff. Title III, which is going to be a new federal fund that we have not received in the past. We will be getting that this next school year. Um, and that supports our English, our ESOL students, which stands for English to Speakers of Other Languages. We have our Title IV federal program, which is for academic enrichment. And we did, we do try to use those funds to help support our two high schools and Fairland Elementary School. We used a chunk of that money to help them last year since they don't qualify for Title I funds. We have IDEA, which is an acronym that stands for a Supplemental Special Education Program. We also have our federal funds that are for COVID relief, for helping us with the relief of experiencing COVID, responding to COVID, preventing COVID, and those are CARES Act, which we've already spent all of that in previous years. And we are now re still receiving ESSER and ARP funds. Those are specifically for targeting what our data shows we need help with to respond to the impact of COVID. And then we also have our CTAE program, which is funded with Perkins. And that is um, focused on our secondary grade levels, which is middle school and high school, for our career, technical, and agricultural education programs. All right, does anyone have any questions up to this point about what I presented so far? And feel free to unmute and share that, or you can also type it into the chat. Okay, at this time I will continue on and share with you some of the action steps. Now in previous years, we had a whole bunch of verbiage up here that was really hard to follow. And so I have changed my presentation to where it's more of a visual. Um, so I'm hoping that that will help it uh, make a little bit more sense. So what I've done is I've taken our action steps that focus mostly on attendance. You will notice that some of these also will benefit our academic goals. Uh, but when we present our plan to the state, this is the category that we have put them under. All right, so the first one we have is um, our internships. These are geared towards our high school students. So this is for having business partnerships that are willing to allow our high school students to work with them in an internship role. This is an action step that is funded with our CTIE program with Perkins funding. Um, and we just feel like this one is really important because we want our students to see a future beyond school. Why are we in school? Why is it important to come to school and get these courses? That when they have the opportunity to go into an internship uh, situation, um, then it can help them see you know, what they're working towards. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And I, we think that that is key to helping kids want to attend school, give them that bigger purpose. Um, we also have our suicide prevention curriculum, which we're currently, yay, we're not having to use any funding for right now. Uh, we have um, purchased those materials and the curriculum in the past with previous funding. And so now we're at the stage where we are doing refreshing courses um, and training new staff members. Um, because we have trainers here in our district that are ready to go and are doing a fabulous, fabulous job with that. Um, you know, there, a lot of kids have been, been impacted with COVID and are just with the seclusion and then the change in our community and the impact that we've had. Uh, we have seen an increase in students that are needing the support. So this is a very important action step. 
Um, we have our PBIS co-coordinator and training for our PBIS schools and their staff members. This is funded with the Special Education Department. Um, that's the department that is in charge of implementing this. And this is a great initiative because it helps with structure in school, rewarding students for positive behavior, um, and making sure our school expectations are consistent throughout the building. And we are really excited about the potential of other schools joining this initiative. Uh, we have uh, approximately half of our schools are participating in PBIS. And the other ones have other similar initiatives like Renaissance, Renaissance programs. So just structure and expectations in the building are, uh, make it a more positive climate, which also encourages students to want to attend school and feel safe in school. We also have our Metaplay, which is a social-emotional pre-K curriculum, uh, because that is, uh, that is geared towards our special education pre-K classes. And we want to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our young, really young kids with their social emotional needs, especially a lot of them um, have not been in an unstructured environment as much lately because of COVID and a lot of people staying at home. So this is a great initiative that helps support our really young kids. Um, on our next row, we have trauma training. And we're not spending any additional funds on this, in this initiative either, which is a great thing because we can put those funds somewhere else. Uh, but our, we rely on our guidance counselors and also Laura Beth Newsom, who is our family connections uh, coordinator. Um, she went to every school last year, and every, every single school had training on how to help students through trauma. And, I mean, it's not just our students. We have really opened our eyes about the trauma that staff members and their families are going through, too, over the last several years. So that's, this is also... Um, a great initiative to help support our staff and our students to help us with our attendance goals. We have our All Pro Dads. Um, this is a program that occurs through Title I. Um, our Title I funds are actually dispersed to our middle and our qualifying uh, elementary schools uh, that qualify for Title I funds. We have what's called consolidated funds where we put together their title funds with their local dollars and give it to them in one lump sum. And then those schools have the ability to look at their school level data and decide um, which initiatives are going to be the most beneficial to their students and staff members. And so uh, we had three schools that had an All Pro Dads program um, this last school year. And that is an initiative that helps get our dads our, and our father figures more involved in their child's education because research shows that when the male figure in a family or a support unit is involved, then academic success is much more likely to happen. And so we're really excited that this next school year that we have eight schools that have already said that they're going to be implementing this program um, now that we're going to be able to have more people back into the building and function more uh, normally at this time. And so we're really excited about this program growing. We've had feedbacks from our moms and our mother figures um, that they would like to have something like this similar in the schools. So we have several schools that are going to be trying um, an initiative similar to All Pro Dads, but it's going to be for moms and the mother figures in the family. And of course, any family member that wants to attend that, we're not going to say no to that because we love family involvement. So that is a great initiative, too, that will help kids want to come to school, get more involved in school. And obviously, that's one that's also going to have a positive impact on their academic success as well. Mentors is an area that we want to really focus on this year. It's been a struggle in the last couple of years. Um, just with the way things have been going on in society lately. Um, but if you are a business partner or if you have experience in a trade that you feel would benefit um, one of our CTA pathways, um, our students wanting to go into art, into construction, into nursing, any type of trade like that, if you are an expert, I know that our CTAE department, Mr. Carruth, would love to hear from you because we are really trying to add on additional mentors so we can really support our, um, our high school students, especially that are 
really thinking about their future careers and what paths they want to take in life. So that is a way that you guys can help us. Um, mission support specialists are an, uh, an invaluable part of what we do here in Walker County. They, we have two of them in our county right now, and they are coming alongside our struggling high school students. Um, they work with our middle schools and high school as well, but they are the ones that help us prevent school dropout. Um, if we have students that are going through crisis, they help brainstorm ways that we can meet their needs so that they don't drop out of school and can, can make sure they're getting um, their credits in school and recovering credits that they might have missed out on in the past. Um, so they are a, a critical part of what we do here in Walker County and making sure that our kids stay in school and help those attendance um, goals that we have. On the last row for attendance, we have Ready Rosie. This is another program that helps support our pre-K through third grade students. And actually, um, we have some teachers that are using this program and adapting it and using it for older students as well. Um, but this we have under attendance because um, it is being paid for with our COVID relief funds um, for, from our ESSER funds. And because so much academic um, interruption occurred over the last two years, this is a program that our parents have given us great feedback on. If you have not used this and you have kids that are in those younger grades, be looking for this. This is a great resource. It's kind of like getting a TikTok video through your text and email. Um, it's a quick little video, like two minutes or less, that will show you how you can help your kids at home with reading, writing, math, even social needs. I mean, I know that I have a child that sometimes struggles with anxiety, and there are resources in the Ready Re Rosie program that will help talk you through those situations and those feelings that your child is feeling. It has really simple, good ideas. Like if you've got a kid that's not even old enough to be in school yet. It has cute little videos that shows you ways that you can help your child develop socially and academically through just a grocery shopping experience. Um, things, activities you can do while you're in the grocery store to talk with your child and help build some of those cognitive and social abilities before they're even ready for school. So it's a great program. Be looking for Ready Rosie. That helps with attendance and our academic goals. We have seven mindsets. Um, this is also being funded with our COVID relief uh, funds that we have, our ESSER funds. Um, it is to help our staff members and our students with social and emotional needs. We have a lot of kids that are in crisis right now and are struggling to get back in the groove of life and getting back in school. And they're going through all kinds of self-confidence um, self issues. And this is a program that we have had training all last year at all levels. It is for elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, our high school students have this in their panther dens and in their, um, their pit crews at Lafayette High School. This is something that all of our homeroom and um, those support groups at school are using as a resource. Our guidance counselors use it as a resource. And it is a really great program to help support our attendance and in turn it's actually going to impact our, our academics as well. And then also due to COVID we are um, looking to employ additional behavior support staff members um, as students and everyone are adjusting to being back in the routine of things um, and it goes along with the, the seven mindsets and helping support our, our kids self-confidence and being in a structured environment, and just all kinds of things that we're seeing come up um, in the last couple of years here in school. So we're really excited about that extra support. And then this last uh, graphic here says new teacher mentorship. Uh, this is an initiative that you're going to see on this sl slide and the next one for attendance. Um, for all kinds of reasons, we have uh, new teachers that we wanted to support. And it's not just for new teachers, it's for any teacher that wants additional support in, in any area that they want to strengthen or um, teachers that have found that they, they want to improve in areas that may not be as strong in others. But we have found that our new teachers have had um, disrupted, disrupted um, 
student teaching experiences and they've been doing lots of classrooms online instead of in person. And so um, some of our teachers are missing out on like classroom management practices and just things like that that new teachers need to adjust to. And we just wanna make sure that we're giving them and our other teachers additional support. Um, and so our schools are all developing our mentorship plans and programs and submitting them to the district. And we want to make sure that we're fine tuning that this year to provide as much support as we possibly can. And then this slide are our academic action steps. And again, like I said, some of them on the previous slide will also impact this, but these are specifically for the, our ac academic goals. Um, as I told you earlier, uh, our Title I funds are the funds that help with class size reduction teachers. And those funds have been consolidated with other federal program money to our Title I schools. And those schools have the ability to look at their data and see, do I need class size reduction teachers this year? Do I have a grade level where class sizes are a little bit more than what that group of student needs or than what we're comfortable with? And they can use those consolidated funds to hire additional class size reduction teachers as they see needed. Um, we also fund our academic coaches to support those teachers. And those academic coaches work with those teachers at least once a week in an organized setting. And then they also go in classrooms to do observations, give feedback and support for our teachers and to um, disperse information about district and state initiatives that our teachers need to be in the know about or receive training on. We pay for them out of Title I and Title II funds. Also, every school um, receives additional instructional hour funds that they can help use those funds to pay for tutors at the school level. But we also use Title I funds to provide additional tutoring for our homeless and neglected students that may have transportation needs or um, they need mileage reimbursement or um, we can also use that for more flexible tutoring situations. Um, and we pay that and set that aside with our Title I funds a portion, but then we also have some of those CARES Act release funds. There's an area called the ARP, the ARP funds, that are gonna be used highly to support our homeless students this year. And we were able to receive two ARP grants for that initiative. Um, our neglected students, they're living at um, homes for students that have been neglected that don't have parents or foster families to live with. We also use title funds to support them um, with tutoring and any other class su classroom supplies or re resources that they need at their home. Um, we take care of that with our Title I funds. Each Title I school is required to have a family engagement coordinator to be the go-between between, between our staff members and our parents and to help provide supports um, to make sure we're communicating the best that we can, make sure that we are teaching our parents how to help their kids at home, especially now that we've had disrupted instruction. We really need to partner with our parents as much as possible to help get our students where they need to be and help push them on um, to show that academic growth that we need. One way that we do that is with data events. We have one school that uses what's called APTT, that's at Chattanooga Valley Elementary School, and they've been doing that for quite some time now. Um, and it is a really great program where the parents are shown achievement data, the goal of where we want them to be, and we teach them a strategy that can be done at home to help boost the performance of their child. And so even our schools that are not APTT schools, they also uh, are implementing data events to help make sure our parents are well informed about how their child is doing and what can they do at home at help to help those kids and what are we doing in the school to help our students. So we want to create that partnership where we're working together. Um, the next initiative is multi-sensory reading instruction. Um, this is something that we really had a large training just a couple of weeks ago with a large number of our teachers. We had special ed teachers, ESOL teachers, some of our speech and language pathologists, and some uh, regular ed teachers where they were taught how kids nowadays need a lot of sensory needs to be met while you're teaching them how to read. So it was a great training with Ortham Gillingham 
and they got great training and great ideas. And I know that um, the schools and I know that my Title I and ESOL department, we are going to be working hard to make sure our teachers have the resources they need to implement that training. So we're really excited. We were really excited to learn new strategies on how can we teach kids how to read, but also tap into their senses and make sure that we're meeting those needs while they're learning. So that's a really cool um, strategy that we're also, if I'm not mistaken, I heard that we are going to have two trained trainers from that training that we can have re-deliver that training and spread that through the district. So we are excited about that. That also ties into the next picture that you have on that second row, uh, differentiated instruction. Um, this is something that we have known is important in our district for a while now. Um, kids are working at different levels. We have kids that are you know, behind where they need to be, kids that are right where the expectations are, and we have kids that are functioning above where our expectations are, but we want to make sure that we are pushing kids where they are to show growth, no matter whether they're already ahead of the game or not. So that is where we differentiate our instruction. And we have multiple programs and uh, processes in place that we want to make sure that we're staying on top of as a district and making sure that we're supporting teachers as they work because it, it is very difficult to different instruction because you have to have multiple activities that meet those needs. Um, sometimes multiple small group lesson plans um, to make sure that you're meeting the kids where they are. So we do that through our special ed IEPs, our ESOL teachers for our students that are learning English. We have what's called the WIDA standards and um, we want to use those to help train all teachers how they can support their students that are learning English. We have our gifted program with their expectations and we have our, our MTSS process where we are uh, looking at our data and looking at interventions that we can implement to help kids show growth in the area that they need that support in. Um, the next initiative is that we want to make sure that we're giving our principals the opportunity for appropriate training for where their strengths and needs and are uh, according to their leaks data, which is their the administrator um, evaluation system. We have what's called the principal center at our regional support center. And so we off, also um, offer that to our uh, administrators in the district to make sure they're getting the professional development that they need. And then the last one on the second row is GACE certification for teachers. We want to make sure that our teachers are highly, um, they're qualified to teach those subjects and that they have had the appropriate training and can meet expectations to be certified in those areas. Um, especially now with teacher shortages, we have a lot of teachers that we might ask to teach something that maybe they did not originally go to college and plan to teach, uh, but they can get training in those areas and they can go take the GACE certification and get make sure that they are approved to teach those new content areas and prove that they um, have that content information that our students need to make sure that we're providing the best, the best possible staff members for our students. We definitely don't want those teachers to have to pay out of their own pocket to take those tests when we've asked them to do something that may be out of their comfort zone for our students. And so we do reimburse teachers for that um, to get that certification in an area that we've asked them to do for us that maybe they weren't planning initially to do for us. So I think that's a great initiative that we have to help those teachers out. On the last row, we have bent MAP Benchmark Testing. Um, that is currently being paid for with the COVID relief funds because when our kids came back, we wanted to make sure we knew exactly where are those gaps in their learning. And the MAP benchmark test uh, does a great job of breaking down the data, not just telling us how they're doing in reading or how are they doing in math, but it breaks it down and tells us which standards should we be focusing on with each student. Um, which... Um, which type of math are they struggling with? Are they struggling with geometry? Are they struggling, struggling with algebra? Are they lacking just basic number sense? And so, um, or is it in reading, is it phonics? Is it decoding? Is it comprehension? Are they struggling with vocabulary? So it gives us more detailed information of where we need to be working with our students to make sure that they're meeting their goals and that they're able to continue um, showing growth through the year and years to come. Um, we also 
have a district focus on supporting our leaders with, as they are creating their school improvement plans, as they're trying to find what action steps are really going to best support our students. What are some great research-based strategies out there that maybe we haven't already tried that might meet the needs that we're seeing showing up in our data? So we want to make sure that we're supporting those leaders, and it's not just administrators. Um, we have lead teachers and other people that aspire to become administrators in the future that we are going to be working alongside with. We have our um, leader academy that we are going to be wrapping up in the next few months and then starting a new leader academy here in the fall. And we, are, we have uh, book studies they're going to be doing with them and book studies that we're going to be doing throughout the district um, that falls under this action step here. We just want to make sure that we are strengthening um, the leaders in our district because that impacts everybody in our district, which boils down to helping our students perform to the best of their abilities. Um, and I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we also will be receiving the Title III federal program funds this year for the first time, which supports our ESOL students, which are our students that are learning English, at the same time as trying to get their academic contact, content in, which can be difficult for them. Um, so this next icon here is we are going to have initiatives, action steps to support those, specifically our high school students that are ESOL students. Um, we are focusing on high school because our high schools are not Title I schools, and these students, when they are at the academic content level of high school and they're trying to learn English, it is a major struggle. And so we want, it's not a large amount of money, so we really had to hone it in on which group of students would benefit the most from this extra federal uh, funds. So we will be focusing that this year on our high school students, and we'll be looking at those initiatives as we support the high school staff members that are supporting those students, providing professional development for them. Um, coming up with sessions that will help support our parents of these students, and so we'll be doing surveys to ask them what are some um, things that we can do to help you guys at home and support you and provide you with what you need. Um, so we're really excited to receive those funds and looking at the data to see how much our initiatives help support them um, in their academic and, and they're, adju they're adjusting to being in a new country and learning a new language. And again, you see the new teacher mentorship listed here because it is going to be a key component to helping with student attendance and our academics. We want to make sure that our new teachers and teachers that just need some extra assistance in areas they want to improve in, we want to make sure we have those mentorship programs um, in place and that they are um, going to be as effective as possible. So I'm going to pause for a moment again and feel free to un- Mute yourself if you have any questions about the action steps that I've shared so far that maybe you need clarification or um, have just any other questions so far. Okay, we're almost to the end here. Um, the next big piece about being a Title I um, a school system that receives Title I funds is that we have to have a family engagement goal each year and um, we traditionally create their goal to line up with our district reading goal because reading impacts so many other uh, content areas. So our family engagement goal this year ties to our reading goal. We want to see a 3% increase from the fall score to the spring score so that gives us the year to try to see a 3% increase in our reading map medium RIT score, which is just basically um, what is the average score that our students are scoring in reading on that map benchmark. So some of the initiatives our family engagement team will be focusing on, as I said earlier, is increasing the participation of our fathers and father figures in our family engagement activities. We want to use data um, to be the focus to help drive our family engagement activities. We want to make sure that our schools are wel welcoming places for our parents and families now that we will uh, be back in business as usual. We want to build the capacity of our parents and families to learn ways that they can help support their child and their academic achievement while they're at home. Just some fun things that you can do at home that 
without even realizing it, that you're helping them academically for what they're having to do at school. And we want to help build the capacity of our school staff to work with our families as partners and how can we communicate effectively and provide supports for our families. You'll notice that when your, your students start back to school that you'll be receiving some, a packet from your family engagement coordinator if your student attends a Title I school. Just to give you a quick snapshot of a preview of what you'll be seeing, I have a copy of our district family engagement plan and it's broken down into hopefully a format that is easy for you to understand with what is family engagement, what are some acronyms that you're going to see and what do they mean, what is our policy, um, how can you work, how can parents and schools work together, how can we strengthen our school together, and how do we use our family engagement funds to best support our families. And then it gives you uh, an, an idea of some meetings that you can help participate in through the year. This one right here that you see in the middle is what we're doing today. We're having a district in improvement forum here in July. And then here are some ways that be, we can build capacity of our parents and our, our staff members. And then here are some activities um, and ways that you can evaluate our program. So be looking for that as your kids start back to school. You'll be seeing a district level one and a school level one. And here we are at the last official slide. Um, you can use your phone to scan that QR code and give us feedback on this presentation. Um, I will also be posting that in the, let me see if I can post it here in the chat. There's a direct link if you want to click that. We will also be posting this presentation on our website and again on our Facebook page. So you can watch it again if you want to, refer other people to watch this um, if they were not able to attend this meeting. Um, there's a place where you can sign in so that we get credit um, for your attendance and a place where you can give us feedback. Um, and we'll be posting that link so that you can sign in and feedback later on if you don't have time to do that right now. Um, Again, does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, there, are, there is a place at this Google form where the QR code takes you and that link takes you where you can give us any feedback if you're not comfortable asking questions or sharing it here in the group. Um, this is a slide that I'm required um, to post up here. Um, this slide came from Slides to Go or Slides Go, and I highly rec recommend it if you use PowerPoints frequently. Slides to Go makes it really uh, quick and easy. I just wanted to give them a shout out since this is their slide template, and I just modified it to my needs. All right, if we don't have any questions, feel free to ask them in that link there. And we'll be posting this within the next week um, on our Facebook page and on the website. And we will leave that up there for this school year that you can give us feedback. I check it regularly. We have um, director and coordinator meetings every month. And I always pull back all of my community feedback links so that if anything needs to be brainstormed at the district level, I do share those with the group then so you can rest assured that we will be reading your feedback and taking it seriously. Thank you everyone for attending today and I apologize again for the technical difficulties. I did learn that our district um, did not renew the um, screen sharing option for this school year and that is why I was not able to share it. I apologize for that but I hopefully this way worked and I will be posting where you can actually have the um, the actual PowerPoint if you want to look at it without the video and have that in your hands. So I will make sure you have all the resources that you need. Um, so I look forward to hearing all of your responses and having you all sign in. And I hope you all have a great day and have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.